Hello and welcome. Well, when I say the word entrepreneur, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? You know, how would you describe what an entrepreneur is? Now, entrepreneurship is ultimately about innovation and providing a solution to an unsolved problem through a product or a service. It's very different to a standard run-of-the-mill business model. Now, an, an entrepreneur introduces to the world an original idea providing an inventive solution to a problem that, in most cases, we never even knew existed until their business provided the answer. Now, it's grueling, it, pre it presents unthinkable challenges and demanding hours. So to think of combining entrepreneurship with parenting, which is also one of the most challenging jobs on the planet and known to man, is really an unbelievable concept. So today, our special guest is not only an entrepreneur and a dad, he's also the CEO of one of Australia's well-known household brands. Today, we welcome Marcus Marchant, CEO of Vistaprint, founder of Bondi Joe, board of director, digital innovation and marketing leader, and a startup advisor, and also father to two children. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? Good, thanks, Rachel. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And it's really exciting to be chatting with you. And I really see you as an extraordinary human. You're not only an entrepreneur and a dad, but you're also CEO of Vistaprint. I don't know how you do it, but I tip my hat to you, sir. And no doubt, you know, you have a lot of tips and tricks to help our viewers and listeners today. So thank you for joining us. Now, thanks very much. I, sorry. Thank you, you know, go, go, go. Yeah. No, so thanks. Thanks for me. I do definitely consider myself very lucky and uh, very fortunate to have the roles I do. It's great to be with you. Well, before we sort of get stuck into all of the nitty gritty stuff, and I've got so much that I do want to speak to you about, I wanted to acknowledge, first of all, we published your article and it's titled Balancing Entrepreneurship and Parenting, How to Become a Successful Dadpreneur. Now, for someone who hasn't read the article yet, can you please tell us what it's about? And of course, just tell us what inspired you to write it. Sure. I, th I think, um, as you touched on, there's so much um, going through his head when they're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur and launching their own businesses. And especially if you're going through the stress of uh, also being a parent, um, it's hard to think, well, is it the right time? And I think my, my real belief is there's never a right time and now is always the perfect time. But it's about prioritizing your effort. It's about working out what's important to you, making sure your priorities are clear. And it won't always be perfect, but trying to keep to those priorities about you know, family first and what have you, and then your, your businesses potentially second and third. Um, and also making sure you're doing something you love, being clear on why you're starting a business and digging deep to make sure that the businesses you're going to start and the entrepreneurial spirit you have will be sustaining because you found something you're so passionate about that that intrinsic motivation is going to be easy to find. Late at night when those kids have gone to bed and you're working on your business, you want to, have, you want to be really passionate about what you're doing to keep on going. Yeah, I mean, there's... there's um... There's, there's a lot that entails entrepreneurship that a lot of people probably don't see and understand um, from the outside in. It's not until sometimes that you delve into it that you understand how complex and challenging it is. Um, but I would love to know from, from your perspective, how do you manage all, everything, you know, a business, a side hustle and family life all at the same time? Like, what, what, what are your key points, I guess, overall? Sure. I'd love to know. I look, I think the first thing to point out is it's really hard balancing everything. And I don't want to be someone who comes on saying, oh, it's so easy. Here's some tips. I still find it a daily challenge. But to me, it comes back to this really clear sense of priority. And it is family first. It's Vistaprint where I work. And, you know, the majority of my working week is that second priority. And then Bondi Joe Swimwear fits in around it. It fits in after those kids have gone to bed. And am I perfect at that prioritization? Absolutely not. There's all kinds of uh, you know, meetings I'll do at night when I miss my kids going to bed, unfortunately, because a lot of my Vistaprint stakeholders are overseas. There's times when I could be doing more on Bondi Joe and I'm not, and it takes a back seat because of the ebbs and flows of, of other life. But keeping a sense of that priority is really key. And then coupling that with working and being as most efficient as you can. I want to spend quality time with my children when I'm there, but when I'm working, I want to be efficient. I believe in 80-20. I believe in curbing your perfectionism uh, and really concentrating on what's important in work in Vistaprint, hiring amazing people. I'm lucky to work with some incredible people at Vistaprint Australia and empowering them and delegating them and trusting and growing their leadership style rather than doing yourself. And on Bondi Joe, 
making sure that I'm doing the things I'm good at and not doing the things I'm not great at. I'm not a great web developer. I'm not great at doing marketing. So I found um, amazing people and amazing agencies that'll help me do that. And so it's about knowing your skills and playing to them and um, continually referring back to that sense of priority and saying, hey, is this working and is this the right balance for me? So what I'm hearing, the first thing is balance is key and, and very important understanding that you can't be all things to all people all the time. Um, as you said, you have to go with ebbs and flows. And, and the second thing I'm hearing is the message of know thyself, understanding what your strengths are and where your strengths are not and hiring people uh, to be able to sort of fill those gaps otherwise. Is that what you're saying sort of overall? Absolutely. I think that's right. It's, um, you know, the, the few, the old um, management principle of sometimes being on the dance floor, sometimes being on the balcony is a principle you almost need to do in your own life. And being on the dance floor and doing is required, but you need to get the perspective on your life, not just your job and saying, hey, am I doing the right things? Am I prioritizing the time I want in the way I want to be doing it? I also think from an entrepreneur perspective, I remember reading a book Many years ago, there's a book called E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Yes. It's an old classic. And he talks about the fact that you know, when you're starting a business, you need to design your org charts for, say, five years in when you've got 100 employees or maybe 20 employees. And you look at all those boxes on your org chart and all those roles. And as an entrepreneur, you're needing to do all 20 of those roles. You're you do. doing a bit of marketing. You're yeah. doing a bit of finance. <laughs> the question is, if you've got a technical discipline from things you've done before, your natural tendency is to go and do that. If you're very creative, you may love doing the social media of your company, of your, of your new entrepreneurial endeavor. Yeah. But the truth is, are the disciplines you've got to be doing and who's doing them if you can't or if you're not prioritizing them? It's this constant question, and sometimes outsourcing is a great option, but not always. So sometimes you just have to do the stuff that you don't want to be doing to be able to grow that business. And I, I love that, that discipline of looking at that old chart of the future and thinking, hey, where am I spending my time? Yeah. It's very important. I, I, I did that um, a few years back and I, um, I had the org chart here. Uh, <laughs> <in the home laughs> it's office. a nice memento on the, on the wall for a startup. That's and, right. And you've got your name under every single like job role from HR to <laughs> finance to marketing to technical. And you say, who is that? Me, 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 me. And then in, in time, as, as you start to grow, you, you do start to bring people in and um, they always say hire for your weaknesses. Don't necessarily hire people that can do jobs that you can do. You hire to, to sort of fill the gaps, as you just mentioned. For Completely. Skills, yes. That, that not necessarily your strength and that somebody else loves doing um but um i just in saying that i just wanted to speak a little bit more about the parenting side of things too in the sense that you know a parent is a child's first and most influential teacher now i'd love to know from your perspective what do you think the main qualities of an entrepreneur are that, that children just can learn from overall Sure, I think there's that. Um, there's a number of things that, I, that an entrepreneur is doing that a child, I think, looks at and thinks that's really aspirational. I think the, the, the having a go and being brave is a great spirit that I'd love my children to have. I want them to face into things they're not good at or that there's a potential myriad of reasons why your business could fail. I want them to look at me and think, hey, Dad had a go at this. And hey, how crazy. He started a swimwear brand of all the crazy things he could do. Um, and that's really interesting. And you know, people who know me probably think I'm not the most fashionable person in the world. So for me to start a swimwear brand, what does that say to my children? So I love that. It shows the discipline. It shows the value of, hey, I could teach myself how to do stuff. I can you know, go and understand the law and how to register a company and do that. I can go and understand in those early days um, how to get campaigns running on Facebook and Google. I need to understand Instagram and Snap and all these new channels that are coming out to people that are you know, probably... Uh, not born in a generation where that's completely native. How do I go and learn that? So my children are seeing someone who's learning, having a go, and ultimately also seeing fail, yeah, and not being put off by it. There would be things I've done. There's certain things I've done on Bondi Joe that worked, some that didn't. And having a conversation, oh, I tried this, I tried that, it didn't work at all, but it was a great experiment. I'm glad I tried it. Uh, there's been certain marketing I've tried, certain trade avenues I've tried. And I think the kids are seeing that have a go. Hey, having a failure, call it what it was, a learning opportunity and just being open with it rather than projecting this image of perfection. Um, that's and okay that's, to fail. Um, not taking what the you risk. take from that and how you that's learn right. to yourself up and keep going as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, you know, skills, for example, in um, like self-discipline and things like integrity, 
persistence, which we know we all need as entrepreneurs, um, a clear sense of direction, I think is very important for kids to understand. Um, but just ded dedication and focus overall, like what are your thoughts of these types of things that kids can learn? Oh, look, I think they're, they're all absolutely. I mean, anyone who's going to be doing, being a, you know, a full-time dad, uh, being working a full-time and has a side hustle, <laughs> you're showing discipline. And if you can balance it, you're showing kids that you, you're prioritizing, that your, your passion, your energy and your, your drive. And I think that that discipline is definitely required to do it and persistence. It can take years to get something off the ground and uh, years of sacrifice and hard work. And I think children growing up in an environment, seeing people do that in all types of entrepreneurial endeavors is just an amazing thing to show someone. And I think in 20 years time, the, the, we all you know, were so encouraged to go to uni and do our degrees. I feel like entrepreneurship now, when you're interviewing interns and grads, they've all got four startups on their resume, but it's <laughs> definitely becoming that incredible bread and butter of, uh, of people's careers now and more and more. And I, I want my children to see and be part of that really early on. And I can't wait for them to start their own. They're a bit too young yet, but I can't wait for them to start their own hustles. That's the thing. And, and, you, and there is a certain formula, isn't there, to, to the majority of all startups. So you'll no doubt have a lot of life skills to be able to provide them as well. Um, That's right. <laughs> and access to some great materials through Vistaprint to be able to... <laughs> make themselves look credible in that beginning <laughs> those business cards those flyers we can we can get all that done just to, to make to start them off well, all my business cards have always been printed from Mr. Print actually <laughs> as well so thank you for that <laughs> but um you know and the, in saying that you know getting back to a lot of the dads um watching and listening and and, and mums of, of course as, as well you know but there are a lot of career dads that have very demanding jobs with long hours um so if we take a positive from this situation um other than this, you know, there, there are a lot of life skills that a father can teach their kids from demonstrating their work ethic overall, don't you think? And leading by example, don't you think? Absolutely. I think, you know, entrepreneurial aside, I think, absolutely. I think children looking at us going um, and really respecting people who are developing amazing careers and, um, and the work ethic or discipline required in any career. And I think if you balance that and when you're with your children, you're really present and they're, they're seeing that and they're seeing that that you have those sides to you. And that um, I, think, I think that's very important to show children. I think we give working parents a bit of a hard time, to be honest. Um, and I, th I think we often shy over the fact that, um, that children are learning and looking at their parents and being inspired by it in a very constructive and positive way as well. Absolutely. Now, for any parent listening and watching that has a business idea and hasn't taken the plunge and the, and the leap forward to put it into action yet, I would love to know what are your words of advice and encouragement? Sure. I think it's start now, start small, and go out there and test and validate your idea and your concept as soon as you possibly can. Don't wait for the perfect idea. Don't wait for the perfect website, the perfect product, uh, all the different components to be absolutely perfect. Get it to market if it's a product or it's a service or an offering as soon as you possibly can in the minimum viable format that's going to happen. Test who, who, uh, who your target market are and maybe not who you think. Get their feedback, get their feedback, get their feedback and constantly change until you've invested and gone too far. But I think the secret is just starting and understanding if you really tap into someone's needs or not in that target market. And um, making sure you're not just asking the same people in your same circle of friends. They're going to be slightly biased towards saying, what a great idea you have. Uh, so really validating really as quickly as possible and then scaling it uh, wherever, wherever you can. But also in reference to the previous conversation, don't be scared if it takes a long time to go from great idea to bigger. Um, you can give it as much or as little energy as you need, but just starting is that amazing first step. And if it works, that motivation will come and so will the time. And yes. then you'll unlock something amazing. And fear and self-doubt, I think, is a major factor that holds a lot of people back from even attempting the pursuit of their dreams. But it's, as you just said, it's not until that you actually jump over that line and give it a shot that you realise, you know, it's just you end up growing so much more with every challenge that you have. So you need to be able to just, as they say, the only way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. So don't look at the elephant and go, I've got to bite, I've got to eat this whole elephant. You're just going to take one bite at a time and one thing leads to another and leads to another and grows and, and sort of takes you on that momentum, would you say? Absolutely. And, and I think, um, I think that's, that's definitely a great point. But also, you know, bringing your friends on the journey, I, I feel like the first couple of businesses I thought about starting and somewhat started, I was almost secretive in that beginning of trying to get it together myself before going and telling people what I was trying to launch. 
And I felt like with Bondi Joe in particular, I was very honest with people years before I even brought it to market saying, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a sustainable swimwear brand focused on comfort. And as a result of that, my friends and family, you know, in all the catch ups over the two years it took me to bring it to market, would say, how's it going? And of course, it was frustrating when I didn't have much to say. I'm like, oh, you know, be busy with my day job. But that accountability and then the doors that it opens when a friend says, oh, you know, my friend owns this, that could. And then the connections come from being very honest and sharing with your network and your inner circle around what you're doing. And I think that's part of that fear of failure is being prepared to hold yourself accountable by telling people you're doing it. A lot of people Absolutely. don't get through that first step of saying, I'm going to try. I couldn't agree with you anymore. It's just once we actually verbalize it, there's one thing yes. being in our own minds and saying one day I'm going to, and look, I believe that everyone <laughs> has got a skill and something to, to leave, you know, in their life legacy, you know, as a minimum, there's one thing. So everyone has that ability to be able to, to do this. And I think in, instead of being in our own heads and being in our own sort of self doubt, when you do verbalize things, it makes it real. Um, and as you said, the minute that you start doing that and the more you hold yourself account accountable by telling friends and family and those types of things, the more momentum it actually starts to bring. Don't you think? Absolutely. Completely. So what was it that really pushed you, push you forward to launch Bondi Joe? Did you see a gap in the market as every entrepreneur does? That they sort of say, this, I want this product or service, but it doesn't exist. So I'm going to go out and create this, this particular brand. Tell us, like, what was it? Yeah, I think to me, um, I, love, um, I love building brands, understanding how brands position themselves and how a brand translates itself into every touch point. So for me, mm -hmm. I had this passion of brand building. And with swimwear in particular, I found... You know, I just turned 40 this year. Um, if you're a guy like me, the, the, the swimwear brands are either super young and, and surf oriented, or they're super old and fluorescent to kind of old men's brands. No offense to anyone listening. But um, to me, there was this middle category of people that still want to be fashionable, um, who have a very strong sustainability ethos. You know, it's car we've got a carbon offset supply chain, fully recycled materials. And how do I bring that to life in an, incre in an incredible way that also sells a bit of Australia? We have a big overseas market for it. So kind of that was really the, the that gap in the market and focusing on comfort and a few angles that I thought there was a customer problem and through validation as I would prove there was a problem and a need for the product we were selling. So when you are really quite um, passionate um, and you have purpose in your business, it does help sort of propel you forward, doesn't it? That is sort of the, the, the driving fo focus overall. And, and do, have you found that that sort of helped you as well? Completely. I, I think if I had chosen something really boring, um, that I didn't want to, like a product that may have had a need, but I wasn't personally so attached to it, I couldn't imagine working so late and so long and for so many years over it. And yeah, you can get motivated by the financial return of a product that you found that has a category and a need for it. But it doesn't, I don't think that that motivation would have been there for me. I think people even look at drop shipping on Amazon and find you know, crazy products that have a margin for a short term that isn't building a brand for me. It isn't building something consumers really resonate with and finding a target market for. It's very niche segmented short term play. And that's probably less interesting to me. I'm not knocking that. There's a lot of money to be made there. But that longer term play um, of how you create a connection with consumers and validate a need is, is really what motivates me. And I think mm. working on something with a purpose is, 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 is the key to life. Uh, I couldn't agree with you anymore, anymore. It just, it gives, I've, been, I've sat down with my partner a few weeks ago um, about something that he's passionate about. And um, until he found that purpose and the penny drops, it's just that there is a magical moment when something just happens and the sense of purpose and the reason why that business exists drops. And once that settles, it's like, did you find the same thing for you? There is a magical 100%. moment that everything changes and that becomes the driving focus for your business and what, what propels you forward and ultimately is the why of the business. Have you found That's that, right. that, it's that as that, well? It's that magical Venn diagram of the, the intersection between what you're good at, uh, what you enjoy and what people need in that very middle. Yes. Uh, if you can find that, you're, it's, you're finding a business that will mean so much more than a business. It's a lifestyle. I look at entrepreneurs everywhere that are complaining, oh, it's, you know, um, it's hard to, or their jobs, that their, their businesses are hard to, and hard to get up in the morning and work with. Uh, to me, that's not the right business for them. I want to find a business that I want to run out of bed in the morning because I'm so passionate <laughs> about it. And yeah, there'll be days, don't get me wrong, there'll be days it's going to be hard on others. But on the whole, like, you've got to get out of bed and want to do it. Well, they say, you know, find what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. That's right. As they say. Absolutely. 
So, I mean, for people now, just getting back to where we were talking about that, that let's say have got an idea, but they're, they're a little bit hesitant and scared to maybe move forward. And let's face it, Australia is in a recession at the moment. However, but I always say that, you know, great businesses are built in tough times. I watched a documentary yeah. recently on businesses that were built during the great depression and also in times of recession. Some of these businesses as an example, include General Motors, Disney, HP, um, General Electric. Um, I really feel, you know, and even just during the GFC in recent years as well, as an example, but, you know, this really leads you and leads us to finding innovative way of doing things and seeing things from a different perspective as well. So if anything, this point in history and right at this very moment is one of the most incredibly and optimal times to start a business, would you say? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, unless the business is focusing on something that's very short term, um, finding customers, the, the same pain points exist. And so tapping into that and making something successful now, um, if you can find the right target market and, and demand is, is key. And hopefully then if you can make it work, as you said, when the economy returns and there's much more consumer spending increases, what have you, the, your ability to grow, depending on what you're, what you're trying to do, is, is there. Yes. So I completely agree with you. It's a great sentiment to have. And, and what you said earlier also is the fact that as an early stage entrepreneur, you have to wear many hats and uh, as I always say, spin all the plates um, yes. and perform almost initially every job role in a standard business org chart from, as we said, marketing, finance, HR, all of that stuff. But have you personally found that the life skills that you, you've picked up along the way um, to the point where you decided, okay, I'm going to launch Bondi Joe and same with me. Okay. I'm going to launch Kittypedia. When you actually look back at your life, you actually realize that life has actually provided you in most cases with the skills um, that you actually need to, to be able to launch your business. So, you know, you've already had those experiences and learnt those particular skills um, to, to be able to do that. And in most cases, everyone's, Done, everyone will have that moment. So for anyone watching and listening, parents, um, mums, dads, everyone in, included, this is maybe a message to just feel, like, feel the fear and just do it anyway as well, do you find? Yeah, that's right. I definitely agree with you. There's a lot of stats that show entrepreneurs who start businesses later in life who are more successful because of that life experience they've had. For me, I started my career as a lawyer. I worked in banking and strategy and business development roles. And I see some of that experience coming out in things I'm doing in Bondi Joe and obviously, obviously at Vistaprint as well, from managing trademark registrations to negotiating with suppliers to managing teams, to managing agencies. There's a lot of my experience that I draw on um, creating customer value exchanges and making sure your touch points align to that. And I see that there's a time and a place. And I feel like if I was trying to launch Bondi Joe in my 20s, I don't think it would have been successful. I don't think it would be where I've made, been able to make it so far to be. So I feel like that don't be discouraged by when you started, if the experience you had really adds to it. And you probably don't even realize it until well into your entrepreneurial journey, the skills you've been leveraging. Hey, I got that from that role I had five to 10 years ago. I think that's great. I've done that so many times throughout my journey with Wikipedia <laughs> that I'll, I'll find myself doing something and I'm like, I actually did this particular task um, 10 years ago in a different role. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's about looking at your, your life experiences and, and what are the jobs and what you've done in your life to that point uh, and basically bringing that all together, understanding that you do have to, to basically perform every role in an organisation chart. And for the, for the positions, like for myself, I could never code a website. So, you know. No, nor could I. Yeah. <laughs> so, as, as you say in the article, that, you know, from that perspective, that's fine. Put your hand up and say, I mean, the, the, this particular role is, is beyond my reach. So that's when you bring in the people to, to, to perform those roles and to help you sort of to move your business forward, would you say? 100%. That's right. It's, you know, obviously, obviously, if you're bootstrapping a startup, um, you know, you don't have a lot of money to play with. Mm. So it's going to be really economic. And there are incredible uh, partnerships and places that you can go to to do that. We've just um, recently partnered with 99designs, a great agent, uh, you know, great model where you can get websites built for you using outsourced freelancers. There's things that we can, um, that you can really uh, tap into to uh, get the product that freelance community to generate some of the things you need from that small business without having the expertise yourself, without paying for large agencies. Yes. And, and, and getting back to the balance with parenting as well. Um, 
understanding that balance. I, I just love to just maybe just reiterate some of the tips that you have for listeners about how they can focus on that balance between entrepreneurship and parenting. Cause you know, a lot of parents think to themselves, how am I going to do this? But you do learn along the way, don't you? Just that passion, love and that purpose. Um, it's That's a, right. It's, it's the same thing, isn't it? That, you, that with parenting and entrepreneurship is that you just learn along the way and you find that. Absolutely. Balance. You never, and I think being prepared to make mistakes, um, not being too critical of yourself. If you, you know, I've, I've, I've done work calls on the side of sporting fields, which much to my children's dis- disgust when they look at me going, why are you looking at me? Uh, but you're there. And that's, and that's me saying, hey, I'm trying to be present whenever I can be, but you're not perfect. Um, and I think that not being too hard on yourself, being willing to make mistakes, learn from them. I tell my kids I'm not perfect and I don't want them to judge me against a perfect dad and I don't judge them against perfect children either. Um, but having that amazing dialogue and, um, and holding yourself honest, but you know, going on that balcony time and time again and saying, hey, okay, so I'm making these sacrifices. I'm missing this or that. Is this really the priorities? Am I doing the right thing here? Yeah. Um, not just that dance floor conversation where you're just doing, doing, doing all day. Yeah. Now in your article, you share the top, seven tips how to go from dad to successful entrepreneur could you quickly just go through a few of them with with us now and i think the first one on that list is prioritization that's right yes i think i was touching on that earlier that i think the key is really um the 80 20 and not being a not being perfectionist it's prioritizing wherever possible Uh, and that means for a vista print hiring great people and in a bondi joe it's about working with agencies wherever possible or freelancers to be able to make sure that priority is really key and um, you're focusing on 80-20. It's definitely family first, but everything other than family, I need to work out how to be the most efficient way possible to get things done and to drop this sense of perfect. And for, so for someone that doesn't one. know what the 80-20 rule is, can you just explain what that is for our listeners? Sure. It's an old management maxim that's probably been well and truly overused, but it's just that, um, you know, I think 80% of the, of the value really comes from 20% of the activity. It's a diminishing return question. So, you know, the closer you get to, uh, I think other people will like to say, you know, 90% is done is good enough. And I think that you need to think about, you know, where do you spend your effort on the biggest, um, lowest hanging fruit that gives you the biggest return? Yes. And not worry about the little rocks that are going to get you all the way to 100% done. Um, they're not important because they take far too much effort to realise. And that's really what 80-20 is about, saying, you know, 80% of the benefit comes from 20% of the effort. So let's only focus on that top 20% of, work, of things that deliver the value. And on the topic of uh, prioritisation, you know, the kids are only young once. So what do you do to ensure that you enjoy just the little moments? Is it about being present, as you said earlier on in the chat? Yeah, like I think it's about being present. It's about um, spending time with them. It might just be simply sitting on the couch, but it's definitely my phone away. It's interruption free. I'm listening. I'm hearing what they want to do. If they want to go to the park for the hundredth time. I'll come to the park for the hundredth time. If they want to um, go to the beach, we go to the beach. It's about being flexible, kind of putting out the window what I think we're going to try and do, what my definition of fun will be or where we should go for our, for a lunch or a dinner and just being with them, doing what they want to do. And I think enjoying them as much as possible uh, and not missing those key moments and asking them questions to me, bedtime, lying in bed reading. I'm reading Harry Potter with my daughter at the moment. My son's reading a series of books, sitting there after the lights out, asking how the day was, what's happening with the friends, just checking in and making that time. To me, that bedtime routine is still really key to have some of those connections. And so I really try and not let meetings happen over bedtime uh, wherever possible. And I'm really loathe to miss, to miss a bedtime and miss that connection. Yes. Now the next thing on your list, number two is be passionate. Can you maybe just explain about that? Sure. I think as we've spoken about a bit in this conversation, you've got to be really passionate about what you do. I absolutely love my job at Vistaprint and I absolutely love working on Bondi Joe and I wouldn't have it any other way. I have worked in roles that I didn't enjoy as much as this and the difference between my uh, my motivation and my passion is is, is, is light and day, night and day to, towards what I'm doing now. I really enjoy it and I think that finding what you're passionate about and meeting that intersection of what you're good at what you um, and what you enjoy doing is um, is, is the secret to, to that happy life. To be honest, I think that's uh, it's really underrated. People do a lot of work that they don't really enjoy, and I'm like, life's too short for that. So being passionate is so key. Totally agree. Now the next one on your list is work-life balance is key. Can you maybe just explain a little bit more about this? 
Sure, I think work-life balance is definitely key to, to anything. With COVID in particular, the boundaries are getting a little bit blurry between, you know, I've been at home since March, my wife's at home as well, um, having the computer always near and the fact that I have stakeholders overseas, my emails do come in 24 hours a day. And I of could course. Be there 24 hours a day. So being able to define time and switch off, blocking, um, blocking my lunch to be able to do some exercise and well have lunch, blocking my evenings so that I don't get meetings over my children's bedtimes and being able to find time and blocking that out and having that work-life balance is really key for my own personal, for personal time, but also as a leader, encouraging my team to do whatever works for them. I'm completely outcomes based. I don't care when they're working, whether which days of the week, where they're working from. Uh, it's as long as they're happy and healthy and, um, and enjoying what they're doing and um, really motivated to do it, then it works for me. So really encouraging them to look after their own work-life balance is key and taking the time to do it for yourself and, and sometimes saying no to meetings. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Having set boundaries is what I'm hearing, is what you're saying. And no doubt that does actually help sort of keep on top of just mental health overall, would you say? Absolutely. That and exercise, I think, are key. Um, you know, any exercise in any shape or form and setting those boundaries, uh, especially when you're new. I, mean, I uh, started a Vista Print in, in, in February, uh, late or late February. And when you're new, you, you're kind of more willing to accept meetings at all times of the day and all kinds of meetings are coming your way. And then to be able to say, well, actually, you know what, I, I don't really want to take meetings before 7 a.m. and I'm not going to take them after 7 p.m. at a minimum. And I don't want to do late nights and early mornings on the same day, for example. And being strict to that, and I think a lot of stakeholders really agree. And if they, understand, if they realize they're blocking over your, uh, your children's bedtime, they'll be the first to move it. So highlighting that, being aware, blocking your diary and holding yourself accountable for it, rather than sitting back and just accepting that um, and the impact it has on your personal life is, is really key. Yes, boundaries and, and understanding you can't be all things to all people 24 Absolutely. hours of the day. You have to look after yourself too. Very, very important messages. Now, the next um, thing on your list, number four, is have a strong mission. Can you tell us more about this? I think that's right. If you um, it kind of goes back to the, the passion and the, and the, and the, and the purpose, if you, you really need to know what you're trying to solve and be really dedicated to that. Um, you know, our mission at Vistaprint is to be the marketing partner for small business and you know, how do, we, how do we enable small businesses to give that credibility and become that, um, become larger than they really are? And uh, through a lot of different products and services is key. You know, in Bondi Joe, it's about solving sustainable swimwear and providing comfort to men that have outgrown surf brands. So those missions are so key. And understanding your mission and, and making sure your whole company articulates and can articulate it is key. But then importantly, that all your value exchanges, every customer interaction proves that out. And when it doesn't, it's time to enhance and change that. And your value exchange needs to improve over time. Yes. Customer expectations change. And so what was good last year won't be good next year. So expectations and experiences are being set by the, the big players from Apples and Amazon. We need to, um, you know, keep up in terms of the experience, even if we're playing in different categories and deliver an exceptional customer experience that enhances and wows and demonstrates that value exchange and realises your customer mission. I think you've just encompassed all, so many, so many levels. There's so many layers to what you just said. But for anyone watching and listening, you probably need to rewind that. Here I am sort of being a retro chick. <laughs> rewind that, but go back and just re-listen to what Mark, Mark has just said um, because there are so many layers to, to what he just said. And there's so many <laughs> moments of probably gold. Probably a two-hour conversation for that. <laughs> yes. And so I was just listening to just going, yep, so there, there are many moments of gold, I think, in that overall. Um, now, um, the next point is about open communication. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about this, about this and why is it important to maintain open lines of communication in particular, of course, with your partner? That's right. I think, um, you know, my wife and I are both working full time and both being at home since March has definitely brought this to a fore. We spend probably more time together than we did prior to, uh, prior to COVID now. And having that communication about, hey, is this even working? Who's um, you know, who's looking after the kids when? You know, kids are lucky enough that they're old enough to get the bus home, but they come home at 3.30 now, which is not the end of a work day. And so we really need to have that conversation about, hey, can we get them to be self-sufficient, What make a snack, watch your TV for an hour or so before we, before we start coming off our meetings? Who's, who's coming off the meeting first in the course of a work day? 
Um, who's going to be doing that? Trainings, all the different things and all the activities. We don't have any after school care now with the COVID. Mm. So it's really changed that paradigm. That constant communication and um, making sure that um, it's a constant conversation. And back to the earlier conversation, you're, you're going back to the balcony and sometimes looking back and going, is this working or are we just driving ourselves mad? Uh, it was a lot harder. I feel sorry for Melbournians that have the kids at home. When we had Still. the kids at home and not at school, it was a very difficult period. I'm very lucky being a Sydney side that the kids have been back at school for a while now. Uh, and that conversation and the readjustment was so dramatic when the kids were at home trying to be schooled as well as us working full time. It's, um, it was a constant conversation. Yeah, so just having those open lines of communication with your partner at any stage um, is, is really, really, really crucial. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and just for, for them to understand where you're at, I mean, there can be so many things that happened um, on any one given day in business as an entrepreneur in life. So if, if you have that moment and have those moments, they understand where you're at and how you're feeling about a situation and, and why you're grumpy or why you're not grumpy or those types of things as well. Um, I think these types of things can have help also, would you say? Completely. Yeah. Now the next point, number six, talking about the ups and downs as well. I mean, there's so many ups and downs as an entrepreneur and they are inevitable. Uh, and it's always important to remember that it's not going to be easy, but you know, in the article, you actually share five tips uh, to pull yourself out of a rut. Um, and I'd love to maybe just go through those with you. The first one is about sure. practicing gratitude. Why is it important to practice gratitude? I think that's right. It's the positivity needs to be on your side. Um, be thankful for you know, the fact that we're living in Australia. Um, we have um, an incredible, um, you know, government provided healthcare and school systems at our disposal. There's so much to be thankful for. And I think taking a stock of that and um, especially in times like COVID when there's a lot more uncertainty around, it's just so key. And I think being grateful for that is, is, uh, is, 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 is key to kind of life in some ways. Yeah. And I think also gratitude of us just living at this particular point in history, you know, despite COVID, but having just, I guess, the online exposure and the access to so many resources, give it anything Absolutely. that we want access to, we want answers to, um, you basically can find it. So just having gratitude, I think, for being able to live during this particular point Completely. in history is another thing as well. Now, the next thing you, you mentioned in your five tips also is about uh, to remind yourself why you started. And you, you did sort of touch on this a little bit earlier, but this is something that obviously is incredibly important for anyone starting a business. Um, and I've always found, and I'd love to know your perspective, that when you have those really tough days and there's things, you know, there's been a barrage of things that have gone wrong. When you understand and you, and you sort of re-remind re yourself your why it's almost like that sort of that light at the end of the tunnel that sort of pulls you forward and that's what sort of just helps you continue going at the um throughout all the tough times do you think completely i agree and that's why it's so important to to have a business and entrepreneurial endeavor that you're so passionate about yeah because in those dark moments you want to be able to dig deep and find your own energy again from that that motivation and if, if you're not passionate about it, you're just not going to, you can find your motivation a few times, but you eventually run out of steam. Yes. Uh, the next one is focus on past victories. Can you tell, tell us about that too? I think it's, um, and it's really important to look, look back and go, hey, I started with nothing. Uh, I started with just a crazy idea and look what's gone my way. These things have really worked. And yeah, there might be a long road ahead, but you've got to celebrate those past victories. Uh, it's really important to enable it and motivate it to say, there's something in this. You've got great customer feedback. You've got a, a test in market. You've, you've built your first website. You've got your first business cards. There's these milestones that show, hey, I'm making something and I've created something that's could potentially create value for customers and build a business for me. So uh, you've got to celebrate. It's, it's part of that um, gratitude in, in some ways and helps you to, to keep on going. And I love the next one, walk it off. Uh, this is something that I do. I mean, it's <laughs> fresh air and sort of um, getting the, the blood sort of flowing through your, your system sort of can help a lot and sort of put a different perspective on things, don't you think? That's right. I mean, the old adage of not, um, you know, not sending you those angry emails, I think really holds true in anything. Yeah, I think, I think when things aren't going well, it's that old, um, old saying of going, go and walk around the block before you send that angry email. Yeah. It's about taking stock and, looking at what's going on and the root causes of it and allowing yourself to breathe, get some perspective and think about the outcome. And most importantly, to think about what is the outcome you want? Yes. If, you've if you're having a, 
a terse exchange with a supplier, for example, you, know, you could send an aggressive email back, but ultimately if you still need them to do something for you and you still need that relationship, then the ultimate long game is to say, look, I'm just gonna ignore your rudeness, uh, but here's what I need and just and diffuse it. So that initial reaction of sending the angry email isn't gonna solve it. So it's about walking it off, getting perspective and ultimately thinking, what do I need to do? What do I, what are I trying to solve for here? Yes. Great advice, which sort of leads into that your next point is make a new plan with a fresh attitude as well. <laughs> Absolutely. I think uh, a lot's been written about the need for a lot of startups to pivot. And, you know, whether it's a smaller or a large pivot, you constantly need to think, hey, what's, what's, the, what's my plan B and how do I need to adjust my plan? If you're bringing an idea to market and your test audience or your test segment doesn't like your product, you can't be put off. You need to ask them what would make you like it and then change and then test it again and then change and test it again. Mm. And I think that that pivoting is well and truly documented in startup language now. The word pivot is probably almost overused, but yep. it's so key. And make a new plan, get a new perspective, reinvigorate yourself because if your mission is true and there's a real customer need for it, you've got to solve it. And it, if it was easy, someone would have done it before. Yes. So it's not going to be easy. <laughs> Now, the last of your seven points is switch off. Why is it important to switch off and just look after your health overall? Well, I think that's right. You know, you, whilst your family is your first priority, to be honest, even before that comes your own personal health. You can't be there for your family if you're not healthy and you don't look after yourself. You, know, you need to find the right balance of exercise and nutrition that works for you. It's really important to switch off and look after your health. Whilst we say family first, to be honest, your health and well-being have got to come first in some ways, because if you're not happy and healthy, you won't be able to be there for your family and for the businesses you work with. So be able to switch off to find the right nutrition and the right exercise that works for you and your lifestyle and what you're interested and capable of doing. Uh, and also concentrating your breathing, the power of breathing and uh, deep breathing to, to, calm, to calm yourself and in stressful moments is just so powerful. Uh, that I think you really need to look at that and concentrate and find what works for you. And I don't want to be a preacher about what I've done. It's about finding whatever you think you, you can uh, makes your body happy and sticking to it. And I understand, getting back to Vistaprint for a moment, um, it started the way that most businesses do with, with one entrepreneur's, I guess, ambition and goal and vision. And that's really proof that all businesses have to start somewhere, really, isn't it? That irrespective right. of how big and how well known a brand actually is it started somewhere and it just started with someone's thought and their passion and their purpose and all of the things that we've just spoken about which is really food for thought for anyone watching and listening that potentially as we said at the start they have got their own ideas and those types of things that they haven't necessarily leapt forward and just given it a shot don't you think Completely. I love the fact that Fister Print was started by our founder, Robert Keane, in his bedroom in Paris when he came up. And it was only 25 years ago where he found a way of printing in low cost that um, enabled us to produce a much more interesting product in market without those needs for those large printers and huge marketing agencies designing for you. And that little idea has spawned into an into amazing global business that's helping small businesses everywhere to, to fulfill their marketing dreams. Yes. And a little bit about Bondi Joe, I was reading also um, that you do a lot to help the planet with a fabric that is from 100% recycled bottles. Yes, um, that's right. Tell me about that. How does that work? Yeah, so the, um, the fabric bottles, uh, sorry, the fabric bottles, the plastic bottles are, are basically collected and spun down into yarn and that yarn <laughs> goes into and makes the fabric that the shorts are made out of. Uh, which is fantastic. As you know, the oceans have a huge problem with plastic. And um, as much as we can take out and reuse in, in fabrics like our, in our board shorts, it's a wonderful idea for the planet. And plastic-free shipping as well, overall. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Plastic-free shipping and a carbon offset supply chain. Um, I think it's very hard for small businesses to offset their carbon, but I'm a big believer that, you know, especially when we offer free shipping around the world, we're going to have a carbon footprint. We need to offset that. Okay. Well, look, we've covered off a lot of information today. but if you were to summarise, I guess, your key messages for anyone watching and listening, what would they be? I think my key message is to have a go. Uh, understand your priorities, find your why and go after it. Um, I think that's really the best thing you can do. Yes. And there've been so many just like pearls of wisdom right throughout the whole interview. And as I was saying earlier on, for anyone to be able to sort of replay those, 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 I guess monologues that you've had because there are so many keys of wisdom and also I think as well for anyone um, to be able to find a mentor and a mentor doesn't necessarily have to be someone physical that can just be adapting and finding someone in the entrepreneurial world that that 
you've got an affinity with their messages and who they are and what they stand for and following them. Everyone's got podcasts and books and all kinds of things out there. And, you know, we are lucky we live in the age of 2020 that we realistically have access to so much endless amount of information. So if you really want the answers, they are out there. Just be resourceful enough and have just that passion and you will undoubtedly find the answers. So just have have a go. But Marcus, I've absolutely loved our chat today. If anyone's got any other questions for you and or want to sort of find out more about Bondi Joe, where can they find you guys? Sure. Uh, absolutely. So Bondi Joe is at bondijoe.com and uh, or else find me on LinkedIn or vistaprint.com and um, feel free to get in touch. Happy to Happy to help and answer any further questions. This has been an awesome chat. Thank you so much for your time. You're undoubtedly probably the busiest person I've sort of spoken <laughs> to. <laughs> so I've, um, Thank I'm so you very much. Yeah, it's been really, really wonderful. But in the meantime, you know, I hope for the opportunity for another chat again in, in not too distant future. Completely. But stay safe. And once again, thanks for your time. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, bye.